Join me as YouTube star Melissa Maker interrogates me about my public speaking business. And I got to tell you, I love a good interrogation. Yeah, I say, welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I'm your host, Timbo Reed, but you, so much more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you are ready to crank out some, just some really good marketing so that you can grow that baby of yours into the empire it deserves to be. And that's exactly what we do around here. Big show today, long show. Big and long show. The tables are turned as YouTube star Melissa Maker takes control and she, as I said up the front, interrogates me about how I've built my speaking business and how you can do the same. We really go quite deep into it. More on that in a minute. Got a motivational quote about the size of your dreams. And we're going to do a little check-in because I've got some really good news for you about a recent past guest. Hey, today's show, lovingly brought to you by NetRegistry, who care about one thing, and that is getting your online marketing sorted. And as I have said many times before, team, you are who Google says you are. So ensuring you have a very solid online footprint is mission critical to the success of your business. And you can check out their exclusive listener packages over at netregistry.com.au forward slash Timbo. We're also made possible by the good folk at Key Person of Influence. I reckon it's a program right for its time. So if you're keen to be more visible, valued, hard word to say valued, and connected in your industry, then head over to keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. They've got a couple of really good live events coming up in Melbourne and Sydney. I'll be at the Melbourne one, and I'd love to see you there. Hey, as per usual, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Now, I think it would be appropriate that we check in on three things that I want to share with you. Number one, in the spirit of last week's show, big hugs to everyone who has bought a copy of my new book, The Boomerang Effect. It's selling like hotcakes, and I've got to tell you, I love hotcakes. I love love hot donuts more, hot cinnamon donuts more. And I look forward to the moment when my book is selling like hot cinnamon donuts. Not far off, but uh, yeah, really uh, humbled by the amount of people, the amount of listeners who have bought a copy. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com if you want to grab a copy yourself. Much more importantly, however, is the sales and success of Daniel Flynn's book, uh, Chapter One. Now, Daniel is the owner of Thank You, the Thank You Group, that is trying to change the world through putting an end to poverty, which sounds just like a massive task. Go back and have a listen to episode 300 if you want to know what I'm talking about. But Daniel put a book out uh, four weeks ago, and here's what's happened. It has sold. 43,640 copies. I got this press release literally just before I hit record. How's that for an amazing amount of copies? He has hit his $1.2 million target. Now, mind you, this book was selling without a recommended retail price. You could pay whatever you wanted to. You could pay one cent or a million bucks, you know. Um, And it's funding the launch of a baby range that will in turn fund infant and maternal health programs as well as Thank You's expansion into New Zealand. So he's reached his target in four weeks. Now, here's some other facts. This is extraordinary. Over 530 views of the video that he created, brilliant video, that's in the show notes of episode 300, 
He had a million bucks of advertising donated. He had 250 volunteers join him uh, packing the books and sending them out of a warehouse in Essendon. The volunteer that travelled the most distance was from Brisbane to Melbourne and I'm very proud to say is a listener and past guest of this show. I'm not sure whether he wants to be mentioned or not, so I'm just going to kind of keep a, keep a lid on it, you know. Uh, book sales went berserk and outsold every business book ever and only second to Harry Potter in airport bookshops. And the stats just keep going. Most paid for a book, $1,300. Most paid in store, 500 bucks. Remember, no recommended retail price. Least amount paid, 50 cents. Hey, who was that? Who paid 50 cents? What a tight ass. That's terrible, isn't it? I take that back. Maybe that's all they had. Anyway, uh, Daniel has done extraordinarily well. Well done, Dan. You are an absolute rock star. Um, what else? One last thing to check in, which seems absolutely ridiculous after that story, but I had all my mug shots taken, retaken last week. I did a photography shoot. And I've got to tell you, team, I have a newfound appreciation for models. I spent six hours having all sorts of photos taken for my website, brochure, social media, iTunes iTunes album cover. Got a very, very interesting photo coming out for that. More on that later, but I will be interviewing the photographer, Jason Mullen, uh, in an upcoming episode to talk all about the importance of photography. But I must say, uh, having just shared all those wonderful stats about the thank you book that my mug shots pale into insignificance. So I'm going to stop now and get on with the show. Do you need a speaker for your next conference? Recommend Timbo to your event organiser. Or better still, book him. Tim Reed. That's R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Now, back in episode 295, guest and YouTube rock star, Melissa Maker, asked me how I built my speaking business. Now, that's not the first time I've been asked, so I know quite a few of you listening are pretty keen to add public speaking to your marketing arsenal either as an additional revenue stream or simply as another way to promote your business, and I would absolutely encourage you to do that. So in this interview, the tables are turned, and Melissa interviews me, which was a lot of fun. Nice being on the other end of the microphone, not knowing what question was coming next. So I reveal everything. I would suggest grabbing a pen and paper for this one because I really do cover the nuts and bolts of what can be a very lucrative business for you and or a really effective marketing channel. So over to Melissa. So I guess to get things started, why don't we understand your trajectory and sort of how you got here? So let's backtrack and find out how you got into marketing in the first place. Hmm. Well, I always, uh, I didn't know what else to do. I was at uni. I was, I was actually at school, finishing secondary school and thinking, gosh, what am I going to study at uni? And I realized that marketing, if I graduated in marketing, it actually led to a lot of different things. Whereas like if I did accounting, I'd have to be an accountant. And if I did law, I'd have to be a lawyer. And there's no way I was going to get to law anyway. But um, <laughs> marketing marketing so broad. And I think that's one of the yeah. things that freaks people, freaks business owners out is that it is so broad. So for me, that was a positive. I went and studied marketing and then um, I, I got a job. My first job was in an advertising agency um, when I was in third year. And um, uh, that was it, like 10 years there, and then I became a marketing manager at a large travel company, and, you know, I was just marketing through and through, and at some point about eight years ago, I, th- I figured I need to go and do this for myself. I can't – I had to escape the cubicle, and I did. He escaped the cubicle, and what happens next <laughs> will blow your mind. 
<laughs> Blew my the mind. Clickbait title. Yeah. So they say it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert mm. in something. I mean, you just sort of explained your career trajectory. And, you know, many of us have feel like we've dedicated a good chunk of our careers to doing what we do. So when did you feel like you were truly an expert in marketing? Was there like a defining moment or event where you kind of felt that you could speak to it that way? Cliche alert. I don't think I am. I, I don't think I'm there yet because um, I just think I just continue to learn. I think I know more than my audience. I know a little bit more than my audience. Sometimes I don't know as much as my audience because there's some peeps, there's some smart peep, peeps in my audience. But um, I just, you know, like I always go when I, before I walk on stage, I do a number of things. But one of them is to remind myself that I know just that little bit more than the people in the audience, and I want to share that with them. And that for me takes the pressure off, and it makes me feel um, in service, if you like. Um, so I, you know, and I'm sure there's a plumber or a vet listening to this who's going, mate, you're an expert because you know infinitely more um, about what about this marketing caper than he or she does but there's so much to learn and the landscape's changing so much you know yeah, uh, just no this kidding. week just this week there's a new, I just came across a new audio social media channel now I don't go chasing the next social media channel this one happens to be an audio one it's called anchor so I'm mucking around with it you know and we'll see where it goes but um, one of the things that I pride myself on doing is or not yeah pride in the sense that again I like to be the guy who relieves the anxiety around marketing that many small business owners have so again if we bring that back to speaking I, I sit with that feeling before I speak and I do these things because I know how scary public speaking is, right? I mean, let's be let's be clear here. Um, I still get nervous yeah. when I go on stage. I can't wait to get on there. But um, <laughs> when you have these mindsets around, I'm here to help, I'm in service, I know a little bit more than the people in the audience, um, I'm going to help grow their business if they listen to what I have to share, these are things that take away it's all about me and puts it back on it's all about them. Right. And, and that's a great answer, and I actually have a couple more questions about that, which I'll get to in a little bit. But I want to backtrack a bit and figure out, so what made you decide to do keynotes? Like, how did, how did you get there? I didn't. I didn't. It, it, it <laughs> found me. It's one of these great stories where, you know, I got a phone call about three years ago. I got a phone call from a lady who says, you don't know me, but I have a client who keeps doing searches around small business marketing, small business marketing expert, and you keep popping up. And I'm going, cool, who are you? And anyway, it turns out she is from a speaker's bureau. I didn't know what a speaker's bureau was. Ah, she mm-hmm. had a client in an insurance company who was looking to, to take a marketing speaker on a road show. I didn't know what a road show was. <laughs> so they flew me up to Sydney. I met with the client. They booked me for an eight city road show. It rent. Oh went, my gosh! Yeah, it was like it went really well. Uh, I was nervous. I look back then, and I, you know, again, you know, we talked about going back to, you know, yeah. your first video, my first podcast. <laughs> it's like cringe material, but yeah, exactly. Hey, your teeth. Yeah, totally. But look, look what, look where we get to. And so the road show went really well. The speakers bureau, who normally books um, known people. I put that in inverted mm-hmm. commas, and mm-hmm. I wasn't one. Um, said, "Wow, who are you? Um, will you, will you become exclusive with us?" And I didn't know what that meant. I asked some buddies who were speakers. It's sort of like dating. <laughs> it was like <laughs> it's actually past dating. It's when you 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 know you go a lot further, and it's like you, we're together now. You know. Um, yeah, that's right. And I did. And so you asked around and people advised you that it was the kosher thing to do? I, I had two schools. There was a bit of a balance. Um, and I went with, I erred on the thought that, okay, being an exclusive with this Speakers Bureau means that I'm going to be special in their stable. Um, mm-hmm. And I was. I got a lot of work. In that first year, I got 63 conferences and I ended up, oh, um, gosh. you know, um, and I really, that's when... It was like this crazy tra- trajectory of like um, I was busy, I was doing something that I'd never done before and I needed to seek help. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. So do you recommend going with a, with an agency? 
Uh, I think I have to say yes, because I've just been re I spent about 14 or 15 months with that bureau. I then went on, I, w- I then um, decided to go out on my own for a year, and mm-hmm. I had a pretty good mm-hmm. year. Uh, not quite as good, but I only had to get like 25% less work because that's the commission they were taking. And I got about that through direct bookings. Um, right. I then have just recently re signed with a talent agency. It's called Ode. And they are kind of like a speaker's bureau, uh, but they also look at you in a more holistic fashion and go, what else could we do with Tim? Um, so maybe get you on TV or in newspapers. Correct, correct. Right. So um, yeah. it, it's not for everyone. And, in fact, you know, they're pretty selective. And I, 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 that sounds egotistical, but it's, it's not like you can't just ring a speaker's bureau and go, I'd like to be on your books. It right. doesn't. It doesn't work that way. Um, no, you're being perfectly objective. That's exactly. That's exactly what it is. And I'm of the mind where you know I, I like the agency idea too, especially if there's somebody who really specializes in what they do. I'm happy to pay a commission. Hmm. Get me the bookings. Get me the exposure. You know, you pound the pavement on my behalf. And that's if and the that's experts it. in what they do, right? Let them go. Let them do their thing. And and that's what you pay for. And you pay a fair whack, but. They get you the bookings. They chase. They chase the inquiry. They get you the bookings. They do all the admin around it. Um, they generally mm-hmm. get you in front of the bigger, the top end of town. You know, so they're going to get you in front of the. You know, I talk from an Australian point of view, the big banks or the telcos or the airlines, and be the same over in Canada, where mm-hmm. they just have relationships with the big organisations. And I was still right. getting work from them directly, but I think I get more work with the big guys than uh, through bureaus than I do just just knocking on doors. Interesting. Well, that, I mean, that's that's great insight. And, and, I'll, and I'll say, this: you may well get here, but I will say, because people who are thinking of embarking on a speaking career and thinking bureaus is the way to go, um, A, you've got to have runs on the board. You've either got to have runs on the board as a speaker or you've got to have a hook. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I got runs on the board, I guess, because I did this road show and I, I did a, a really good job and so they kind of saw and they got great client feedback. Um, I also had a hook that was that I had the number one marketing podcast in Australia. So that, right. that's something to hang your hat on and for them to – because the Speakers Bureau looks at it and goes, well, when a client rings up with a conference and we put Tim forward, they're going to say, who's Tim? So therefore, right. Tim needs a hook. Now, there's the other example where the hook comes to you. So there was a lady last year, the Australian, the Australian of the year was a lady by the name of Rosie Batty. And Rosie uh, had never spoken before. She all of a sudden found herself thrust into the limelight by being Australian of the year. And I do work with the Speakers Bureau that she became a part of, and she was basically speaking every day. So she went from, you know, nothing, not even considering it, to actually a full on, fully blown career in public speaking because of the hook, which was Australian of the Year. That's, I mean, that's great. And that's also just marketing in general, right? Like finding that good hook that gets people interested or excited. So, you know, for any of us who are thinking about, going out and doing something like this, really figuring out what is the hook. And I I guess that leads me into my next question, which is, can you explain what a keynote is actually comprised of? So when you are putting your piece together and you are thinking of what's my hook, what is it? What's it comprised of? What's a keynote comprised of? Interesting question. So is that a technical question? Like what makes, what makes... Yeah, it's sort of like Part A, Part B, Part C. Cool. So, okay, so keynote is the terminology used for, I guess, like a, a, it's a presentation, which generally goes for between, in my experience, and I can really only speak from my point of view, but it goes, I've done it from 20 minutes through to 90 minutes. I did two 90-minute keynotes just last week almost virgin on workshops because they were, you know, 90 minutes. I mean, you've got to get people to do stuff. So let's talk about a 60-minute keynote, right, just to kind of hit the middle ground. And for me, what works, and I'll go back a step to say that the minute I thought, gee, this this public speaking thing is getting serious and it looks like it's going to be a a significant part of my business going forward – I went and employed two stand-up comedians and they became my speaking coaches, right? Wow, yeah. what a great idea. Well, I was travelling with a guy, a past guest of this show, a guy called Brad Smith who owns a motorcycle brand in Australia. 
Brad, I, I was at a, at a conference with Brad uh, in Cairns, and this was very early days of my speaking. I saw Brad, and Brad was like a young, late twenty year old guy, right? And mm-hmm. a real character. And he got it. And I, when I saw him, I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. I wonder what he's going to, how he's going to speak, what he's going to speak about. He got up on stage and he nailed it. And when he got off, I said, mate, 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 <laughs> where did you, where did you learn to do that? And he said, oh, Troy and Zara. <laughs> I go, cool. Okay. What's Troy and Zara's phone number? So Troy and Zara turn out to be these two stand-up comedians, conference MC. They're they're a couple. They're hilarious, and on the side they work with people like me to construct a really good keynote. So um, I rang them, um, and the first this, this will answer your question, but it's the long way around. But I think it's important to understand because it's quite an interesting you know, story. Great. So yeah. So Troy and Zara said, Rip, okay, um, we'd like to work with you. You know, they don't work with anyone. Again, they kind of take you through this kind of process to see is there upside in working with Tim? Can we make mm-hmm. a difference? And they, they thought they could. So the first thing they did was I thought we'd get we'd meet and we'd have coffee and we'd have a laugh and um, it wasn't the case. They said, find us a boardroom. So I found a boardroom at the Speakers Bureau for which I was signed and we'll meet you there. I thought, oh, that's cool. Well, they'll come in and we'll have a chat. Well, it wasn't like that. They, we met at ten o'clock on a Wednesday morning in this boardroom. They walked in. Hi, Tim. Hi, Troy. Hi, Zara. And they said, "Have you?" Oh, by the way, they said, "Have your presentation ready to give." And they walked in, sat down as an audience would, and said, "Off you go. Off you go. Present." So there was, and there you were. You yeah. had to imagine them in their underwear, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> and um, we'll come to that. And um, so I presented my keynote, and then they pulled it apart, and then and very lovingly pulled it apart, and they videoed me doing it, and we kind of reviewed that, and then it was like, so then for the next kind of six months, I worked with Zara via Skype video, just working on the keynote. So to your question, what Zara taught me to do was the keynote that I presented to them in this boardroom, it was full of very useful facts, yeah? It had little story and few jokes, okay? So there's real learning there. So what I had was a keynote that fortunately it had good information in it, so people were interested, but... It wasn't that engaging because it had no story and it, it didn't mm. have enough gags. And, it, and by gags, I don't mean like oh, you've got to be a stand-up comedian. No, no, no. you just right. got to every now and then put a smile yeah, on you someone's Yeah, to invigorate do- the audience Correct, somehow. correct. So mm-hmm. Zara basically said, okay, let's work in chunks. And if you want to think of chunks as chapters. And so we'd find the chunk on limiting beliefs. Or the, around you know around marketing, or we'd find the chunk on podcasting, or video marketing, or self publishing, which is what my keynote is is made up of. And so we'd find a chunk, and then she said, "Okay, each chunk is made up. You've got to make a point, you've got to tell a story, and you've got to crack a joke. And you can do it in any order: tell a joke, make a point, tell a story, tell a story, crack a joke, make a point." And just shuffling it around like that. So, and then there's got to be a really good opening. You've got to have that, you've got to have that story at the start where, you know, you just, and then, so we worked on that. And I, and in the first instance, Zara was actually making me write, write the script. Now I don't work off a script, but she made me write it down so that I could see it and read it and get used to it. Um, to the point that it became second nature. And and what that does as well is that it allows you to muck around with words because right. if you ever see, uh, you know, read Steve Martin's book, um, Born Standing Up, brilliant book for a speaker. Wasn't I don't think he intended it to be, but he talks about mm. playing with individual words and changing words and changing where the words sit and the timing of those words and you all of a sudden you know one word can make all the difference you know in a gag it's a a real art Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to know how to finesse the material as much as you have to know how to create the material itself. Yes. And so so the keynote is just sort of one piece, right? Like you sort of said this I am Tim Reed, this is what I'm going to talk about and you had your points and that's what you always present. Like you you've came, you've come up with this core content and that's what the team was helping you sort of yeah. refine. Yeah, yeah. The aim okay. of the aim of employing Troy and Zara was to work with one keynote and to get that refined and, and nailed. And now I've given that keynote <clears throat> I don't know, hundred and fifty, two hundred times. Um so it just rolls off the tongue. It's very easy. Do you know what's really yes, yes it is. But and and it, there was a point there's a point in that journey where I thought I'd get bored of it. There was a point in that journey when I was getting people in audiences saying, oh, I've seen you before, mm. and that would freak me out. I would, my immediate was right. like, oh, you go and get a coffee and a donut because you've seen this. And they go, no, 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 <laughs> we loved it. And there was that point where I realised that there's a couple of realisations. One is um, the Rolling Stones still play satisfaction, right, number one. Yeah, <laughs> it's what people want to hear, and it's it works. So the, I kind of worked off that. Uh, not that my keynote is it, it's my satisfaction, I guess you know. Um, and the second thing is what I've realised, Melissa, and you probably realise this too, is that as you get more comfortable with your content, you can start. You get more confident with it, and you can start playing with it. And yeah. most importantly, you can start playing with the audience more, which is I never did that for the first hundred. I was just yeah, like, okay, okay. I, so I've got through that chunk and now I'm going to in my mind and now I've got this chunk and now, now I can stop, now I can look around, now I can check in on how they're going, now I can ask if, has anyone got a question? Now I can, now I can walk off the stage and wander through the crowd, which I think to me early days was one of the scariest things that you could do but this is where all of a sudden you know down the track as you get those 10,000 hours up and I don't know how many I've got up but you can start to play with things in a way that will benefit the audience more yeah and I guess I mean I guess when you get there you you must find a way to sort of take the temperature of the audience and see how people are reacting to your material and then you can sort of you know, given the fact that you're so comfortable with it now you can sort of incorporate new and different things and sort of test things out and see how they're received. I, I guess it's very mm-hmm. similar to what a comedian does, right? Totally. You develop your material, yep. you take it out for a spin and you, you sort of refine it. Like you were saying with the Steve Martin book. And then yep. you, you sort of, you sort of, you know, basically look at what the rest of the audience is thinking and, and you can engage with them and interact with them in different ways to help keep the energy up and, and get yep. them excited. And it's wh- so interesting. And one of the things that I do you talk about the temperature of the audience is one of the things that I make a real point of is um, uh, at the start of the conference, or I'm not always at the start of the conference, but before I speak, I like to go and meet the audience. So I will go out, like let's say I'm speaking after lunch, first one after lunch, I'll get there at lunch um, and I'll wander around, meet people, introduce myself, have conversations, how's your marketing going? What are you doing? What are you finding difficult? Uh, what have you done recently that's given you some success in the marketing of your business? And I'll start to do, that'll do two things. I get to eyeball some of the audience. I get to get a sense of where they're at. I ask how the conference has been. Um, and I may even find an anecdote or two where I can say, hey, listen, I, it's actually interesting. Over lunch, I was speaking to Emma. Uh, Emma, where are you? Oh, okay, Emma, you know how we were talking. Do you mind if I share that story, Emma? And all of a sudden, you've got some kind of this. I, I'm part of them, you know. That's right. And yeah. Emma's now a little mini celeb at the conference. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's great. It's great. Hey, team. Before we go deeper into the big wide world of public speaking, let's hear about a couple of businesses that want to help build that baby of yours into the empire it deserves to be. This show is made possible by Key Person of Influence, which according to the Huffington Post is the world's leading brand accelerator program. Now they've got some very cool one day events coming up with some amazing speakers. So I asked head honcho Glenn Carlson to pick his favorite. His answer may well surprise you. 
That's horrible, mate. Um, I'm going to have to say, while there's Matthew, who's built, you know, the third fastest growing company in Australia, sold it for tens of millions. Valerie is obviously one of the best content creators in Australia, talking about profile. Tim, you know, his company's built over a billion dollars worth of value in his clients. Andrew Griffiths, 12 best-selling books. But, mate, I'm the MC. I'm the one that brings it all together. So, you know, despite all these amazing speakers that have got incredible tenure in their space, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my favourite's got to be me. Oh, you got to love a big cheese that backs himself. All jokes aside, do your business a favour and grab a $57 seat over at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. Support for this show comes from NetRegistry, a one-stop shop for getting your online marketing sorted. Verity Ma, their chief marketing officer, recently told me this story of a very happy mechanic. So one of my favourite stories of customers that I heard was a salesperson was talking to a mechanic and he was talking about what sort of email he would like to have and what kind of hosting, whether he wants cloud or cPanel hosting. And the mechanic just said, look, I don't care, build my website, here's my phone number, make my phone ring and send me the bill. And that was the last we heard of him. He didn't provide us content. He didn't provide us any details about his business. We had his contact details. We wrote all the content and we just got his phone ringing and sent him the bell. Net Registry, where happy mechanics go to grow their business online. Visit netregistry.com.au or give them a buzz on 1300 638 734 and tell them Timbo sent you. And now, back to the interrogation. I actually have some more questions about uh, about what you do to prepare and mm. and and whatnot. But I want to I want to touch on on what you were talking about earlier, and that was sort of how do you adapt or prepare your keynotes for, let's say, the Victoria Realtor Association versus the Melbourne Plumbers Union? Hmm. You know, you're, you're going out and you're seeing two completely different groups and you've got different people, but you have this core content, you know, how do you adapt that? I got it. It's a good, great question. I get a couple of things is, um, I believe and my keynotes full of case studies, uh, and the commercial outcomes of those case studies. And I strongly believe that the plumbers union need to look outside of plumbing for ideas and the real estate guys mm-hmm. need to look outside of real estate. So I don't, um, the, you're, in, in your question was an assumption that you, you probably need to have a plumbing example and a real estate example in your keynote. Um, I, I don't think that's the case. I think we need to look beyond it. Um, if I'm aware that oh, actually there's actually a really good plumbing case study, it's not in my keynote but I've heard about it before, uh, then, yeah, like I'll go and I'll, I'll draw on it. But... That also, and, I, and from my point of view, it means that my keynote can remain fairly consistent no matter who I'm speaking to. Um, there are other things that, I mean, we talk about this keynote, which is my helpful marketing keynote, by the way. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there are other things that I talk about. Some, some people might ask me to talk about customer experience or podcasting or blogging or websites. And, you know, it's interesting for those, for those jobs... I have less of a constructed keynote and it is still more in a kind of just it's full of it's full of helpful content but not necessarily right. with well crafted stories and timing of jokes and things but I find they become more workshops than keynotes anyway. Yeah, and I guess I mean because you do the podcast and you speak with so many different business owners and then you have the other side of it where you're interacting with your audience and you're hearing their questions and seeing their responses to the interviews that you've done, you really do have a, a wealth of information. Mm. So I suppose even if you were pulled in to do something that wasn't necessarily part of your keynote, you have so much experience to draw upon and now you've developed the skills of sort of public speaking, you can meld the two and, and put something really interesting out there. I, and that is therein lies one of the massive upsides of um, creating content like you and I do mm-hmm. is that we have so much to draw upon. And there's a great example, and I actually kind of wish this would hap- This has happened more. It's only ever happened once, but I think it was the best job I ever did. <laughs> and I was asked to speak at the opening as the opening keynote speaker at the Real Estate Institute of Victoria's 
annual conference, and it was at one of the biggest rooms in Melbourne. Uh, and we ha- I had 750 hungry real estate agents sitting there, right? Tough crowd in my mind. <laughs> Who's this guy? Who's this bloke walking up on stage? Who's this Tim? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get there two hours early because I like to do AV check, make sure my slides look good, make sure the embedded videos are running, that the sound's good, check my audio, check out the- all that. And I got there two hours early this time because it was a really important job to me. At 9.29, which is when I was speaking at 9.30, the AV guys still couldn't get the projectors working. No audio was working. No audio or video was working. So I had no slide deck. I had nothing. Uh, The conference organiser was panicking and the, the MC's gone, well, I've got to go up. I've got to go up. So he's walked up and he started to introduce me. So... Uh, I said to the conference organiser, get three roving microphones out into the audience and we're going to do a Q&A, right? So I was introduced, I got up and I, for the first 10 minutes, I did my opening part of my keynote, uh, doesn't rely on slides. Um, I didn't tell them what had happened, um, but it doesn't rely on slides. Um, And then I said, so listen, that's pretty much my view on marketing. I know marketing's a dark art for you guys. You know, it's a bit of a like, it's a bit of a mystery. You try some things that they don't work. You try other things. They work beyond what you thought that, you know, it's like, I'm here to help you kind of get some more consistency in your marketing. So what questions have you got? So then the questions started coming in from the floor. And what I was able to do was draw on all the previous people that I'd interviewed in my podcast mm. and start to reference, oh, you know, there's that, there's that Melissa Maker. She's, this is, she, was a, she used to clean houses in Toronto. Now she's nailing video marketing and, you know, like, so I could start to draw on those kind of experiences. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's so great. And, and it's so wonderful too, because, you know, the organizer probably thought you were total pro for just going up and handling it. Right. I did get a rather large um, bundle of goodies afterwards. Oh, well that, that's always a bonus. I mean, that and a free lunch, why not? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it brings me to an interesting question about AV components because they can be a little bit nerve wracking given your most recent uh, anecdote, mm. but they, they can also be really helpful. And I know I've been to some keynotes where I've seen people who just heavily rely on the slides. Like I remember being at one and there was so much legal ease. Everybody uh. just, you know, people were just falling mm. asleep. It was so boring. Yeah. Other times there are just fun and engaging and super helpful AV components. Mm. Um, you know, so, how, so do you like them? Do you not like them? And what's a healthy balance? So by AV, we're talking slide deck. Are we talking microphones and other things? Well, I, yeah, you know what? I guess I, I shouldn't use the word AV. I, mm. should, I should more use the word visual components cool. because you need a mic. I mean, yeah, 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 you gotcha. have a great voice, but well, you well, still need yeah, yeah. Well, interestingly enough, uh, you know, there are mics and there are mics, you know, like um, I'll talk about the, the visual components, but, you know, like um, I never stand at a lectern. I hate lecterns. So we put, I put that aside. Um, I, the lapel mic that you can attach to the front mm-hmm. of your shirt, um, that's generally what you're going to get. Um, I don't like them because the minute you turn your head, you're off mic. Um, and they actually don't have that good a quality sound. So, um, and I keep meaning to buy myself one of these. I just haven't because they're eight hundred bucks, and I'm a tight ass. But um, it's it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a sort of like a Madonna. It's a skin coloured mic that comes along your cheek. Yeah. Oh, I know it. You, you, I know it. Yeah. It's groovy. It's well, you know, you can hardly see it. Um, you can turn your head any which way. It'll always pick you up. Um, it's got beautiful quality sound. It's called a Countryman microphone. Funny name. Great microphone. Hmm. Um, um, so these are little things that you learn along the way. But but to the to the audio, to the visual aids, I use Keynote, uh, Apple's Keynote. Um, I, I've had a, you know, I've spent a, a considerable amount of money having my slides designed by a pro. Oh, um, They are mainly, um, yeah, I spent like uh, two and a half grand, you know, having, having my slides look beautiful and look consistent. And um, I... But an investment, so well worth it. Uh, you got to spend if you want to if you want to be 
if you're serious about speaking, I'm finding mm-hmm. this more and more even as we speak. You've got to you've got to drop some money. I'll tell you where that money gets spent. But okay, you know um, my keynote. It's mainly pictures um, where there are words. There might be three or four words. Um, they're fun. They're not. They're not funny. They're just engaging slides. Um, right. I. Again, I'm only working from my experience, but I also know in answer to your question that it's interesting if you go between, you know, maybe a whiteboard and some flip charts with butcher's paper and your keynote, and maybe you've even got an object. If you can go between these things, and and like not all in one 60-minute keynote, but if you can integrate some of these visual aids, then you are going to be a more – it's going to be a more interesting speak uh, keynote, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Mm -hmm. But I just rely on the keynote and and, and really spend my time trying – not trying, but connecting with the audience. Which I take it is one of of the best – things you can do to really help secure yourself in the speaker circuit. Because, you know, once the conference organizers, you know, I I think a lot of them ask for feedback and they'll typically, you know, if they find that, you know, Tim was a great speaker, you have a much better shot of getting asked back. And Mm -hmm. then that feedback would go back to your agency. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I also wanted to know, how do you make contacts? I mean, you, you, you are with an agency now, but when you were independent and let's say someone's kind of starting out, how do you make contacts and, and sort of get bookings? What do you do? Who are you networking with? Yeah, that's a good question because in my experience, um, I wasn't, you know, I was found. Um, if, if, if it was now, and I was going, gee, I wouldn't mind doing speaking. It's 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 actually a really tough question because I'm so mm. – I now have like these six speaker buddies that we go away twice a year for two days and, you know, and talk about each other's businesses. I know I know the president of the National Speakers Association. I, I just kind of like I, – I just net – I always – that network's established. But if right. I was starting again – one of the things that I would do is to – I mean, you've got to do the free talks. I hate free. Um, <laughs> I'll do free every now and then. But, you mm-hmm. know, starting out, free can be a good thing. Um, and free talks, you know, for me, it would be business chambers or associations. And I'd say, right. yeah, okay, I'm happy to talk. Um, I'd like to be able to video it because I, wanna, I either want to review myself and debrief it with my coach or – um, I actually want to use that vision in my showreel. And I think I touched on it earlier, but I didn't mention showreel, but your showreel is everything, is everything. Be- yeah, I've been asked for a demo reel before too, you know, just of clips whenever I've done TV or if I've done sort of interviews or radio interviews. And you're absolutely right. People want to know what they're spending money on. They want to make sure they're making a good investment. Your show reel. You think about it from a conference organizer. This is the people that are going to book you. Yeah, they are going to want to see uh, what you look like, how you appear on stage. They're, all they're thinking is they're going to be at the back of the room during this conference. The boss is going to be on a table somewhere. They don't want to get the look from the boss that's go, that's basically the says eyebrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, the, at what point was this person a good idea? You know, right, like right. they don't want that. So this show reel, uh, outs, you know, so the show reels you in action on stage. It could be uh-huh. you to camera that sort of says, "Hi, I'm Melissa," sharing your why. Um, there might be the odd testimonial. There'll be logos of other businesses that you've presented for to credentialise yourself. Um, and it's a it's a ninety second reel. You know, I'll put my show reel on as a link in the show notes to this chat with you and I. Fantastic. Um, but it's important. And for me, it was actually, they're not easy things to get. The easy way to get a mm. show reel together, A, you've got to get speaking engagements. Mm-hmm. B, if you really want to expedite the process, you've got to carry, you've got to bring a camera crew with you. Uh, and they and they capture the footage. And for the next five speaking engagements, you're going to pay a camera crew to capture the footage. Probably a two camera shoot, one right. one following you, one on side of stage. Even better, one on the audience to capture. Mm-hmm. You know, if there is a shot where the audience laughs, 
and you've captured that, oh, that's gold. Um, so you can't just clip in a, a, a shot of just a random audience laughing really hard and slapping I, their knees. I, I'm sure it's been done before, Melissa. I'm sure your your idea is not original. But I, um, you know, I didn't do that and I, over the course of a long time, maybe over a year, finally, because when I, I got to the, I got into the habit of, I was being booked to speak and then I would ask, oh, cool, uh, that's great. Are you guys videoing it? Yeah, we're videoing it. Video, great. Um, ha- can I, well, A, I'd like a copy. That's part of my agreement to speak. B, who is it that is videoing? Can I please mm-hmm. have their contact number? And if you really want to push it, you actually roll up with a stick or a hard drive and get them to dump right. it there and then. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, or a prepaid post bag that says, "Put here you go, all you need to do is put a stick in and send it to me. Right. Oh, that's great. So in terms of pricing your keynotes, mm-hmm. let's talk money. How do you know what you're worth? Yeah, well, interesting question. I remember someone once said to me about pricing. Uh, they said, um, what you need to do is you need to stand in front of a mirror and you start with a relatively low number. And then keep going up in increments of, let's say, a 1,000 in this case. And once you start, once a smile appears on your face that you can't remove, go back one, and that's your price. (laughs) Wow, what a great format. That's a bit cheeky. I love that. Um, You need to do your homework. You need to see what other speakers are charging. You need to go, like, for for me, for me it was the fact that, um, and still is to a point, I'm a no one in a world where there are, like I lose a lot of work to market. There's a couple of marketing speakers that have TV profiles in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, I potentially a more practical speaker than they are, but I don't have, they can't say, you know, as seen on, they can't say that. They say Tim hosted a number one marketing show. Great. But there's a show here called The Gruen Transfer, and there's a couple of guys on that. It's an advertising and marketing show on TV, which is very popular. Oh, um, great. And, you know, so um, I have to see, well, what are those guys charging? I need to um, see what conference organisers, like what's the threshold of a conference organiser going, yeah, that's manageable or that's just out of the, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So... Um, What's, what are the other factors? I take the Bureau's advice. I right. try to get a budget. Like, what's your budget? I tell you whether I, I, I can work with I always find that it. such a sticky point, you know. Mm. People, nobody wants to throw out the first number, but you, you get into this weird dance, you know. Yeah. If people were just a little more forthcoming, I whenever know. we're trying to negotiate a fee, we always just say, just give us an idea of what your budget is and I we'll know. see what we can do to make it work. But I know it, it's a great tip to, to, to get a feel for the budget. But, but I, my, my, for my fees, uh, generally from $5,000 up to, you know, internationally for, you know, if, you, if you're going to be days away, up to potentially twelve to fifteen grand. Um, Fantastic. And, you know, that, that probably doesn't mean a lot to you because your market would be different to my market, but that gives you that gives listeners here some kind of ballpark. Um, and, you know, again, for, for a conference organiser of a reasonably large conference, that five grand mark is, is that's kind of where their head's at. That's, there's an expectation. Yeah, he's going to be five grand. Um, and then as you start to get over... Um, then you've got to figure out, well, um, A, is that affordable for them? What additional value could I add? Sometimes I go, mm-hmm. I, 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 in addition to that, um, I'm happy to run a one-hour Q&A webinar three weeks after the conference um, because I know that my the audience uh, will be inspired to take some marketing action and questions will develop, so I'd love to be there to answer them. Um, That's got, a great tip too, the yeah, value add. Love value that. adds. Value adds that don't require a discount. Right. Right? So yeah. what, how can you add value that has a low perceived, a high perceived value to them and a low cost to you, you know? Mm-hmm. Marketing mm-hmm. nirvana right there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And, um, you know, um, you know, I've got my book coming out in the next two weeks. Thanks for the testimonial, is- mate. 
My pleasure, and I'm really excited to read yeah, it. Yeah, good, good. You're in there, so you should be. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the value add there of saying, hey, would you like to buy a quantity at a discounted price? If not, I'll be selling them at the back. You know, I'd like to be able to sell them at the back of the room. Always ask because, again, you're being paid to go on someone's stage. So I don't believe it's an opportunity to pitch. But, if you know, what I did, what I have found, and this is where I've let myself down as a speaker, is that I haven't had anything uh, to sell on the day that's good you know that means i've left money on the table but i also know that if you do a good job on stage then the audience are going to want more of you they might want a book they might want a video training series they might want to um join your forum you you know all these things so you know my books i take delivery of it in 10 days time and i've already sold 200 copies uh to a couple of conference organizers who i said hey listen you know would you like to buy a quantity of the books? And it was it was like yes. And then you can even do book signings. Yep, book signings. Because I've I mean I've been at events where where the organization has purchased X amount of books. They bring in the speaker, and then the speaker does signings at the back of the room after. Yep. And you know when we were having our most recent interview, you used the phrase "back of room sales" with me, and I had never heard it that way before, but I knew exactly what you were talking about. And really a light bulb went off for me because I thought, yeah, I mean, I've been at conferences before and I've seen the big tables with the people working the back. And I would have to assume that that does generate a significant amount of revenue. I can, I can tell you, and I won't reveal names or numbers, but I have seen extraordinary numbers being done. Uh, I love hearing that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so inspiring. Well, uh, just, and again, because, you know, this is not about, the, the, I always go, because the, there's two types of conferences, those ones where the speakers are speaking for free, the audience have mm-hmm. paid nothing to be there, and so they're going to get pitched. I never speak at those conferences. I just speak at private conferences for organisations that are taking their teams or their staff or their franchisees away. Um, and I'm being paid to do that. That said, those people are still necess- necessarily, if you do a good job, going to want more of you. So right. and th- this is where I've seen it. You know, like I've got a mate who, and this is this is going to be my strategy with my book. Um, I've got a mate who does a lot of speaking, uh, highly prof- regarded as one of the better speakers in Australia. He puts mm-hmm. a beer jug at the back of the room with a $100 cash float in it, $10, $20 bills, um, with a pile of books and says, help yourself out the back. Leave the money in the jar and take a book, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's frictionless. It's, it's no hard sell. And there's a beautiful honest, honesty system attached to it. Um, and, oh, by the way, I'll be in the foyer if you want me to sign it, you know? That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of musicians are doing the same thing now with their CDs, or, or I should not use the word CDs with their digital downloads. They'll say download the album and donate what you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to yeah, get the totally. Content. That's that's a fantastic strategy, and and I mean, you're all about finding you know the extra revenue streams, and I think that brings up a great point. Like you don't want to be Mister Hard Sell up there, no. but. At the same time, if people really are picking up what you're putting down, you might as well find a way to capitalize on it. Totally. And and, and that's oh. why, um, yeah, so I'm really excited. Like, you know, I'll tell you in six months' time how it's gone, but I'm, I'm pretty upbeat about it because the idea of, you know, just having those books. And, and the other thing I'm doing is a CD series, and you could do this. You could do the video. You could do the DVD series mm-hmm. where I've taken um, – six interviews and um created a three a three disc set and i've put some intro and outro around it and i've transcribed each interview and put it into a three disc set and again that's that's already pre-existing content yeah and and that's you know no real extra work on your behalf and those are what i like to call just the 24 7 sales you could be sleeping and you're still making sales because I, I assume, you know, you can also sell that stuff online. Online. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so that's great. Cool. And uh, and what about from a skill development standpoint? I, you know, when I think of you, I think you're very confident. You're very composed. You're a great speaker. You're very concise. 
Did you have to do anything to develop those skills, you know, from a public speaking standpoint, or I know you were speaking about, Mm. you know, working with the coaches, but was there anything else that you had to do from a preparedness standpoint to get yourself ready to do keynotes? I think I thank you for those kind words because I, 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 um, I, I, I watch, I'm always watching myself because mm-hmm. um, I, I can kind of rattle on a bit. Um, I listen back, to, and I still do it, but if I listen back to some earlier podcasts, oh, the lead into some of my questions, I'm just, I'm literally, and I don't listen to, um, I don't actively listen to my entire episodes, um, but when I do, and when I have, there's been some lead-ins where I'm yelling at myself going, would you just <laughs> get to the point? So I think land the plane. Yeah, yeah, land the plane, mate. Hey, stop talking. Um, I have said to my editor Daryl a couple of times, Daz, and I don't edit my podcast, but there's been a couple of times where I've gone, mate, just can you just snip that, snip the lead into that question because that is just plain embarrassing. And um, so the learning there is we've all got to watch ourselves. We need to be aware of what we're putting out there. We need to be mm-hmm. conscious of the fact that again. It's not about you, you know, it's about them. Mm -hmm. And so I did have a copywriter, and I've shared this on the show previously, a copywriter once said to me about great copy, keep removing words until it stops making sense. Mm. And I kind of, I guess, have taken that into my speaking. Troy and Zara um, were very good. Comedians are very good at economy of words, they, I love that. That's oh yeah. man, what you a know. brilliant tip! Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, I kind of just am always watching myself. Certainly, don't always get it right, but at least if you're watching yourself, you can be making improvements. But, you know, I, I do the same thing. I find it very helpful to watch back. You know, tomorrow I'm doing a, a segment on a TV show here. And every time I do that show, because I'm a regular expert, I'll always watch my segment after and I look at my hmm. hands. I look at how many times, you know, I have habits of saying exactly or that's right. So I'm always trying to build hmm. a level of consciousness into the work that I do so I can continually improve, similar to what you're saying. It's, it's very and, helpful and, to watch your stuff. And, and uh, by the way, our line's deteriorating a little bit. I think it's manageable right now, but we'll see where that goes. I, I, I hate our listeners to uh, not not be able to hear us. That would be defeat the purpose of what we're doing. Um, oh, I totally agree. <laughs> have you have you got? And let's we'll just keep recording. We can let our listeners uh, hear us sort this technical thing out. Have you got like Dropbox sure. or Facebook or email open um, that could be getting in the way of the internet? Uh, I'll close down my browser. I've closed everything else. Although a text message did ding, which was ah. very very not nice of my text message. <laughs> scenario okay while you're doing that what i will say is that um it's good to watch yourself and you go you watch yourself uh having been on tv tomorrow but i think even better go and find some people on tv that are doing similar things to you experts Mm. on other on other programs and what do you like about them or what don't you like about them and um you know, for me, with my podcasting and my speaking, uh, there's been some people who I really admire and kind of draw inspiration from. I'm going to some random night tonight. I'm going by myself. I don't know who's going to be there, but I've heard <laughs> there's a series of talks on in Melbourne, five-minute talks, 12 speakers. Um, it's sort of – it sounds a bit teddish to me, but I'm going along. I've paid them 50 teddish. bucks, and I'm just going to go and see what they talk about. That's so interesting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Just looking for people who you admire and seeing what they're doing right and how they're really nailing it and sort of gleaning the tips that you can to to develop your own. Yeah. Um, I have another question, and I know that you've touched on it a few times in our conversation so far, but maybe you can give us a little bit more insight. 
uh, you know, preparedness is so important whenever you're going on stage, Mm -hmm. you know, particularly when you're doing a key, a keynote. So what do you do the day before the night before and the hour before you Mm -hmm. give a presentation? Uh, don't sleep. (laughs) Okay. Check. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I sleep poorly the night before a job. Um, either because of the job itself or because I'm not a very good traveler and I'm in a, in a, I'm in a, an alien bed, you know, like in a hotel in a city. Of, yeah, so – but I um, – what do I do? Uh, so the day before – okay, every day. Uh, I don't have a job for 10 days. As of today, I don't have another job for 10 days. Um, I will practice the opening of my keynote every day. Every single day, yeah. when I'm driving in my mind, at some point, um, you just got to. And Zara just drilled this into me. She would actually say you should be practicing your whole keynote every day, and I would agree with that. But I don't. Wow. Um, so I do that every day. Um, in the lead up, um, I'm just. I, I know that three to four days out. I just let it start to. It's just simmering in the back of my mind. I'm just. Mm-hmm. I'm subconsciously thinking about it knowing that it's there's a job coming up um on the there there are there's all sorts of bits and bobs i do to you know in terms of travel you know we can get into the detail of travel but like i have a toiletry bag that mirrors the toiletries in my bathroom so i'm it's in my suitcase ready to go i don't have to you know, pack a toilet bag. Packing. Yeah. yeah. I've got a list of all the things that I need to walk out the door with, you know, wallet with, are all my credit cards in there? Um, my, um, my VGA adapter for my MacBook, my phone charge and my, my, my mouse pointer, my, um, my lip balm, you know, just, just, mm-hmm. it's just a list that I know I need to take. Sure. Uh, so I'm not thinking about it and I can literally walk out the door ready to go. Um, on the day, um, I do things like um, there's so, there's actually so many things. This sounds ridiculous, but this is the difference between I wouldn't mind doing the odd speaking job and speaking is what I do, right? And there's, they're very different things. And because speaking is what I do, you know, I do things like um, I text the conference organiser when I land in the city, so they know oh, Tim's at least Tim's in the state, you know. Yeah. Um, they I let, can sleep better. Maybe not you, but at least they can. They can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I let them know when I'm on site. Um, I'm very clear about um, I want to do an AV check, you know, at least two hours beforehand. So if I'm speaking at the end of the day, what's, you know, when's lunch, when's the afternoon tea break, um, I want to meet the AV guy and I actually work hard to establish rapport with the AV guy because they're so important to us. Um, Mm -hmm. I walk the room. Sometimes, and I think I've mentioned this before, if I haven't, it's embarrassing, but I I touch the back of every chair because I I do sort of believe in that woo-woo thing of like the space. Like I I I want to know that I've walked the entire room and so mm-hmm. I've been there. I don't know. That's just. A, I know that sounds weird, and people are now switching no, off. But um, I ground myself. I do a little kind of like I stand on the stage, and I actually look around the entire room. Um, I um, what else? Well, I obviously meet people as that. I actually greet people as as they're coming into my session. I make a habit of standing at the door and saying hello. Now I could look like the bouncer. I could look like the the I don't know what I look like. Sometimes people go, oh, they see because I've got the microphone on. You must be the next speaker. But right. um, all these little things, you know, just like um, I, I make. Do you do any? Do you do any vocal preparedness? Uh, yeah, I do actually. In in my room. I just do in my in my hotel room, or if it's a local job in my car, maybe just like like a bit of, a bit of anchorman stuff, you know, like sound oh, goat a, sounds. Yeah, yeah, that's a funny. You remember that scene in Anchorman where he's sitting at the desk and they're just about to go on, and they're coming in the back door. They're coming in the back door. <laughs> <laughs> but just to kind of make sure that, you know, all those different levels, and I've done no vocal coaching, but i just getting sure that the, all the different levels of your voice can go because I do like to play with my voice on stage. So one thing I know that if we speak like this for the entire time, the audience are going to be absolutely exhausted 10 minutes into the keynote, right? So I'll be sort of going, yeah, so this... um. 
this marketing thing can be a bit tough because sometimes we're going thinking we think we've absolutely nailed it and then other times we're like what have I got to do to get this right and I just Mm. that confidence comes I think in that's the kind of thing I was talking about earlier where you can start to give yourself permission to do that um you know um the other thing I do on a sort of uh, administrative level is uh, you always do a brief generally two weeks before a job the client wants to get together on a phone and or they often want to meet I don't see a need to meet uh, for a one hour keynote uh, it can take that can take a lot of a time uh, and mm-hmm. it's not best use of theirs or my time but I do want to have a phone call with them and uh, we go through all the different stuff and book AV times and talk about what I'll be sharing and all that um, I tell them at that point that I use the word wanker in my keynote. Do you know, do you know that word? Yes, I've yeah. heard it before. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so I use that word um, uh, and I get permission that that's okay. Um, I have a photo, I have an image, I talk about self-publishing in my keynote and I talk about the fact, I make joke of the fact that this self-publishing thing, it's got a little bit out of control. Everyone's publishing a book these days. And I have four different book covers, all of which are very funny. And one yeah. is um, how to make wooden sex toys. Like someone <laughs> has written that book. Now I get, again, permission to uh, just say there's no surprises. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I do is I ask for three names of three delegates who are going to be in the audience, one who is absolutely nailing their marketing, one who is completely bamboozled by it, and someone who's neither here nor there. And I ring them and have a chat and get and find out where they're at. Yeah. Wow. Wow. There's, and there's such great strategies. I mean, there's so much in what you said that anybody who wants to get into doing keynotes can sort of take with them uh, and sort of toy with as they they build out their strategy, you know, for yeah. day of. Because I know whenever I do anything, I have a whole routine of what I do, and it's taken you know many years of developing it and figuring out what works for me mm-hmm. and what's most helpful, and how do I ground myself yep. and how do I interact. So that's great. Um, I, I just have one more question. I and love I'm being interviewed of, by you, by the way. I well, I am having a great time chatting with you. I think I think you're loving the opportunity to share some of your own marketing gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a nice um, turn to the so, table. I guess so. Uh, if you had to give advice to somebody who wanted to start doing keynotes, what are three things <laughs> you would tell me to do? I think I've just given them thirty things. I mean, you have given thirty things, but if I wanted to get started tomorrow, mm. just give me. Three off the top of your head things I could do tomorrow to get started. On the assumption that you're very clear that this is the right thing to do and that mm-hmm. you're, you are serious about making this a business it's, and it's not a lead, it may well be a lead generation form for the other part of your business, but that shouldn't be your intention. Your intention mm-hmm. should be you are going to be a professional speaker and make a living from it. Okay. Um, if that's the case, I think the first thing to do would be to get clear, um, go and go and write that slide deck. And I don't mean get it designed and look beautiful, but literally open up Keynote or PowerPoint and and craft your Keynote, you know, literally what's Just it? get the content get down. Get the content down and play yeah. with it um, and start to you know, get a confidence around, yeah, there is something, it's problem solve. It's either, it's either going to solve the problem of my audience and or entertain them at the same time. And again, I don't mean being necessarily funny, but can I deliver that in an engaging way? Um, The second thing I would do is I would start to really look at other people who are doing this go and not necessarily in your industry, but go and look at a whole lot of TED talks Go to some talks, get out of your comfort zone and look at what conferences are happening and go and see how other speakers are doing it, uh, good and bad, and mm-hmm. um, that'll help you develop your own um, – It'll help you own your own space. I've got an episode coming out next week, actually, with a lady, Julie Cross, and she talks wholly and solely about owning your own space. And Mm. this is something that I pride myself on is that 
I, I try to be me on stage. And that's not easy. It's not easy being me. No, it's not easy being yourself because what we try to do, and you'd find this when you first hit record all those years ago, you probably tried to elocute every word to within an inch of its life and and you felt awkward. And it's like there was probably a moment, and I'm guessing here, and Melissa's shaking her head because I'm seeing her here, listeners, but um, there was probably a point where you started to be yourself and yeah. everything fell into place. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't excuse myself for sounding more Australian than the average Australian and mm-hmm. I don't excuse myself for not being as academic as maybe some other marketing speaker. You know, I, I just got to be me because mm-hmm. if I'm me, then I don't, have to, I don't have to remember anything, you know. Right. So that's two things. Um, okay. The third thing is you've got to spend money. You, you know, I didn't do this in the early stages. Um, I had a pretty crook-looking PowerPoint keynote that I designed. Um, if you, if, you know, here's here's some places to spend money if you're really serious. You got to get a speaker's website, timreed.com.au. You got to get a show reel. You've um, you've got to get a look. You know, go to a stylist. And and this sounds this does sound wanky, but no, that's you know, a great point. You, you have know, to look the part. You got to look the part, and looking the part does two things: a, it's part of your personal brand, and b, if you're if if part of that is like you've got your speaking outfit, then you don't have to remember what to pack each time. It's like Bingo. that's the jacket, that's the shirt, that's the pants. You know, um, unless um, you're like me and you bring three outfits with you <laughs> each time, because why on. not? Can you, why not? Are you a shoe person or a kind of jacket or what's your thing? Oh, are you kidding? I don't know. I stand in my closet oh, with my hands no. on my hips and I go, what are we doing tomorrow? <laughs> so, um, yeah, a website, real, a stylist, um, getting your slides, getting a brochure done, like a literally a four-page PDF brochure that you can leave behind, um, write your book, have a leave behind, all these things. Um, you know, I think you've got to spend... There's there's some there's some investment in the thousands and 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 as it is with any business right you're yep. you've got to have some sort of investment and you have to have enough faith in yourself that once you've gone out and done a great job you'll start to make the money back Correct. and pay off whatever you've invested. Correct and and you know if you've done your numbers and you think you can get to be you know you might start off being a you'll do a few free jobs um you'll very quickly i think if you do half a decent job you'll be starting to get two three four five thousand dollar jobs i mean you're going to start paying off that those sunken costs relatively quickly Hmm. well this has been so enlightening and i'm glad that we ended up doing this because I feel like I've learned so much more and Good. I'm going to put a lot more thought into into how I can get my keynote strategy up and running for 2016 among all the other things that are going on. You'd be great at it, Melissa. So, I, I mean, it is it is another thing. You've got a lot going on. You've got yeah. to be clear as to why you would want to add it. Maybe something mm-hmm. has to give in order for mm-hmm. you to do it. I, I don't know, but you need to... Um, you need to be very clear on why you're doing it. And um, once you do that, then everything will fall into place and you'll absolutely have a ball. You'll be fantastic at it. Thanks. And thanks for, for all of your knowledge today. Pleasure. It was, it was great. Done. Well, there you go, team. Everything you wanted to know about public speaking but were too afraid to ask, I would encourage you to add it to your marketing arsenal. You never know what might come from it. It's been amazing for me. I would normally share my top three attention grabbers from the interview, but I was the one being interviewed, so that would be a bit weird. But uh, if you have something to share, head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 303 and leave a comment in the show notes. I'd love to know if you are going to add public speaking to your repertoire uh, or whether it just scares the absolute pants off you. Rosabeth Cantor once said, It takes as much mental energy to dream small as it does to dream big. So, you might as well dream big. Righto, team. Hey, that was a long episode. 
one of the longer ones, I'd have to say. Now, there's plenty of marketing gold coming your way in the weeks ahead. Next week, we are joined by this fellow called Sean Callahan, who takes us inside the art of crafting stories that help us sell more stuff. you got to love that. You know how passionately I feel about storytelling, and I think you're going to enjoy you. Well, if you don't enjoy next week's episode, you are going to benefit hugely from it. Hey, big hugs in the spirit of last week's episode with Adam Lippin, the cuddlest, to both Net Registry and Key Person of Influence for making this show possible. Be sure, team, please, to use Net Registry if you need a website or any part of your online marketing sorted, basically, head over to netregistry.com.au forward slash Timbo and uh, you will find some exclusive listener packages. Grab a seat at the upcoming Key Person of Influence Business Brand Accelerator over at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. I'll be going to the Melbourne one and would love to see you there. As I said, might have a beer afterwards, hey? Thanks to my editor extraordinaire, Daryl Delirious Misson, for being the generous, giving human being that he is. Plus, he makes me sound half decent. Hey, and uh, also thanks to Lockie Dolly for doing what he does very well and for doing something that I wish I could do, and that's sing and play instruments and just generally be an all-round rock star. I'd kind of like that. You know, like Michael Hutchins from In Excess. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. Hey, check Lockie out, lockydoley.com. If you need a speaker for an upcoming event, timreid, R-E-I-D, .com.au. And if you really want to surround yourself with motivated business owners, then I would suggest joining the Small Business Big Marketing Forum over at crankmymarketing.com. 69 bucks a month, 30-day, no questions asked, money-back guarantee, can't see a lot of downside there, team. Until next week, I am Tim Bo Reed. Thanks for listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.